And I'm taking a journey Why don't you come and go while there's still room Now I've already made my reservation On this flight that is leaving soon Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready It may be midnight or morning or noon Well, I know that I'm anxiously waiting for this flight that is leaving soon. I'll be going when I hear that last trumpet with the bride awaiting for the groom. And the time is at hand for my departure On this flight that is leaving soon Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready It may be midnight or morning or noon All I know is I'm anxiously waiting For this flight that is leaving soon well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready. It may be midnight or morning or noon. All I know is I'm anxious to wait in for this flight that is leaving soon. For this flight that is leaving soon. Welcome everybody back to our Saturday night session. We're a little late. They were getting a uh, freebie, a freebie lesson, a mini lesson before we get on the real stuff tonight. Y'all good to be glad to be here tonight. I want to uh, <coughs> just say it's been a gracious, gracious time uh, to be with you folks. Y'all have really blessed me for coming out, and I want to thank you for all the hospitality, the generosity. Uh, the attentiveness last night was a uh, powerful service. We had a good time this morning with you. This afternoon, tonight's going to be uh, teaching. We're not going to try to keep you as late. We're a little run running behind. We're going to try to keep this really quick tonight, but it's going to be deep. We're going to talk about the rapture of the church as it relates to Passover and these feasts. And, um, and then our uh, service tomorrow is going to be a little different. It's going to be a Sunday afternoon uh, communion service and Passover. We're going to um, look at the Passover table, the elements of the Passover table, and how they pertain to Christ. And then we're going to have communion with you right after that. It'll be a short teaching, relatively short, Tennessee time short. Don't plan nothing for four hours tomorrow. <laughs> Now, we've done pretty good. I was looking at the times. We, we went about an hour and 40 minutes for the most part. That's on average, hour and 30. So that's not too bad, is it? And, uh, but uh, we're going to be here tomorrow, too. We'll get you out of here pretty quick because I know some of you got to go home tomorrow. But I want to thank all of our folks. I'm so good to see you folks from Mankata, Minnesota, for coming down. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all. And uh, coming from Oklahoma, um, Good to see you tonight. Your family's precious. And uh, now your daughter, I'm going to just give a shout out. You are at Rama Bible College, and she's going to Guatemala. Y'all, she's going to she's going to where? Brazil. Brazil. And when that is when? May 22nd. May 22nd. And what's your name, dear one? Emily. Emily. I'm terrible with names. I'm sorry. Um, what's my name? Does anybody know what my name is? Oh, thank yes. you. Okay. Uh, Emily is going to Brazil with her group from Raymond Bible College, and I'm grateful that uh, she's here tonight. And uh, we've had some young people here, and uh, it encourages me when the young people come out. Um, 
it does because it gives me hope that they are concerned about the Word of God and the Bible as we move forward. Uh, no matter how long the war tarries, uh, we're going to need a generation of kids that are going to lead us when we're gone because if the Lord tarries any length of time, I won't be here forever. Wished I could be, but I can't be. Um, but we need to pray for this generation that's behind us, and we really mean that. I hope everybody's, most everybody should be here. If you didn't get one of these, this is the handouts from this morning, and actually it incorporates last night's teaching as well and um, so forth, and we will um, leave this over here at the table. There's a couple of them left if you have it. We've got some extras underneath here. But also, uh, I think everybody, does everybody have one of these right here, the Daniel pamphlet? Everybody got one of those? Holly, do you have one? No. Let me, um, I'll just leave this right here for you, dear. Just pick that up before you go home. And, uh, but we're going to look at that a little bit tonight, but we're not going to really deal with it. But that's something you can take home and study. And the Daniel study is basically the empires that have uh, persecuted Israel. We talked about that a little bit this afternoon and also yesterday morning, or this morning, I should say. Tonight, I want you to uh, turn in your Bibles to the book of Exodus. We're going to deal with something that is going to be a little different in nature. Exodus chapter 12. Genesis, Exodus, second book of the Bible. And we're going to look at a parallel tonight between the events of the first Passover and the catching up of the saints. The catching up of the saints. Now, I want to read this passage in Exodus 12. We're going to read the first word of the first verse. And it says this, And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Folks, I want to just reiterate something there that I said this afternoon. When the world screams their anti-Semitism at the Jewish people, that's one of the things that they scream. You all kill Christ, don't they? I want you to notice this passage in Exodus 12 and 6. The whole congregation, the whole congregation had to kill the lamb. The whole congregation killed Christ. The whole world killed Christ by our sin. Amen? And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, bitter herbs, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden it all with water. But roast with fire, his hand with his legs, and with the putinance thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remains of it until the morning, you shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded. I want you to look at this 11th verse. You shall eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. In verse 13, And the blood 
shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, what I just read to you is one of Israel's most sacred feasts. It is the beginning of her spiritual calendar. It begins in reality tomorrow night, or not tomorrow night, but Monday night, the 22nd of April at sundown. There's a couple of things I want to illustrate to you about this feast tonight, and then we're going to deal with how it it is um, seen as, um, hang on just a second, let me see if it's right here. There it is, right there. Um, number one, this feast uh, is called Peshach, P-E-S-H-C-H in Hebrew. It, as God told Israel in Exodus 1 through 2, it was the beginning of months. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, and I want to look at that with you tonight, if you'll turn there with me, 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. We're going to look at the feast first, and then I'm going to look at how it ties to the rapture. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. It tells us this. It says, actually it's 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, that's my bad, not 2nd, my bad. 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, 1 Corinthians 5 and 7. It tells us this, and I'll just read verse 6, it says, Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you were unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Now what that verse means is this. Whenever Israel would celebrate the Passover, and this is an intriguing thing you, that you need to sort of remember tonight. It's very important. During the Passover, Israel was required by God to use unleavened bread in the Passover. Unleavened bread, we'll show it to you tomorrow. I don't have time to pull it out tonight, but we'll look at, um, I should have pulled it out, but we'll talk about this more tomorrow. But unleavened bread is bread without yeast. That's the leaven. It's what causes the bread to rise. These were unleavened bread. When Christ had the last Passover with his disciples, they were basically partaking of a Passover Seder. And the part of that Passover Seder that we're going to honor tomorrow is actually the Lord's Supper. It's part of the Seder. And we'll go through that tomorrow. But tonight, I'm just talking about the feast in general. But one of the beautiful things about our salvation is that when we come to Christ, we have leaven in us, all of us. And when we come to Him, the Holy Spirit comes in and He seeks to make us a new creature in Christ. And part of that process is getting out any leaven that is in us. Now, leaven is a type of sin. It is a type of evil. It is a type of wickedness. There's a parable in Matthew 13 where Christ speaks of a woman that she took three measures of meal and then she took a little leaven and she buried the leaven in the meal. And that leaven in that passage basically means false doctrine. And Paul is telling the church at Corinth, he's saying, whatever you do, you need to understand that the Lord wants the leaven to be purged. In other words, he's saying that you may become a new lump, act like that you are a new creation as you are unleavened. It speaks of the position that one has in Christ that is our standing, and it is the business of the Spirit of God 
to bring our state up to our standing. Let me explain that to you. This new beginning of months, because a lot of people get very confused about this. When you're saved, when you're born again, you are secure in Christ. You, you, by faith, you enter into a standing of being in Christ. Are you with me? You're in Christ. That's what you have to be to be saved. That's what you have to be to go in the rapture. They that are in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, your standing is secure in Christ. Now, when you came to Christ, I wish I could tell you that God took his hand and he zapped you into Christian perfection on the first day you got saved. Let me totally convince you and totally tell you without contradiction that is not true. Folks, I've been saved a long time. I've been saved since I was a child. I first came to Christ when I was young. I ran from the Lord for many years, and um, the Lord has used a series of events over the last decade to bring me back not only to my relationship with Him, but to my calling. I was running from a calling. And there ain't nothing more miserable. There ain't nothing a state of more misery than to be running from God and run from the calling that's on your life. It just ain't. I don't suggest it to anybody because it, it, it leads to a lot of problems. But my standing in Christ, in all of this running, and all of this sort of running from God, I never lost faith in God. Does that make sense? I never went to a point where I didn't believe in Christ. But the Holy Spirit was at work on this right here, getting my state, because my state wasn't too good. You understand? My state is what I was acting like and living like. It wasn't too good. And I'm not going to get into the discussion. Is, is if you'd have died in that state, where would you be? I don't want you. I wouldn't even want to know. I wouldn't even care to know because I don't think it'd be a good place. But I know this: the Holy Spirit was trying to get my state up to my standing. You, you follow what I'm saying there? That's what he's doing in every one of us tonight. He's trying to get the leaven that was in us before we came to Christ out of us and make us a new creation. And if we will allow him to do that work, we will not only have a new beginning in Christ, but we will be a new creation in Christ. Amen? And that's what Passover was to be really representative of to the Israelites. I got to make a few statements about the Passover feast. There's a lot of Christians that are going to enter into the celebration Monday night. And they honor the Passover, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing with going to a Seder. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. But a lot of Christians think that by going to a Passover Seder, that that's somehow making them more righteous and more holy than those that don't. The feast itself, folks, ultimately in the sight of God is only a representative of really what God's concerned about, and that's Christ. Christ is our Passover. Did you notice that verse there in 2 Corinthians? Paul said Christ is our Passover, right? That means that everything that these feasts typify, they are types of the coming Redeemer. They were types in the Old Covenant of the coming Redeemer in the New. When we were in Waveland, Mississippi, we did this teaching on a Friday night. I'm going to sort of do it tonight on with you. Passover, Passover is a type of the cross. The unleavened bread feast, which takes place the day after Passover, is the second feast. It's a type of the burial of Christ. And the first fruits feast, which takes place at the end of the unleavened bread. This is seven days, Passover is this day, this is a three-day, of two-day event, first fruits one day, is a type of the resurrection. And then Pentecost is 50 days after first fruits, it's a type of the Holy Spirit fall. All of these feasts, these are the four, four fall feasts, Passover, Unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. You can read this in Leviticus chapter number 23. 
And it gives you a summary of these feasts. All of these feasts, all of these feasts typify Christ. They were fulfilled when he went to die on the cross. They were typified and fulfilled by him. And in doing so, they show us several things. But one of the things they show us is God's plan for planet Earth. And after Pentecost, there's a break. There's a break. There's a break in the feast. And I'll just draw a line. There's a the summer season. There's a harvest time right here. And then you start the fall feast of trumpets, atonement. These are back to back. And tabernacles. Now, I'm going to bring this over. Let's see it. Trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. <clears throat> Somebody want to take a guess? What does trumpets you think represent? In God's plan? The rapture. The rapture. The rapture. The rapture. Anyone want to take a guess what the day of atonement might mean? That is part of it, yes. But when she, when is she going to do that? At the end of the tribulation. End of tribulation, when Christ comes back. back. So you're right on it. The second coming of Jesus is typified in the Day of Atonement, when he physically comes back to earth. And then tabernacles, I'll just put kingdom age, because I don't know how to spell millennium. It's when Christ sets up his earthly kingdom and tabernacles is a feast where they built booths and they would dwell in booths. And guess what's going to happen during the kingdom age? Christ is going to come back and do what? He's going to come dwell with us again, right? So, we've got these feasts. But the feast that starts it all right here. Let me turn that off right now. The feast that starts it all is the Feast of Passover. This is the beginning of Israel's spiritual calendar. This right here is the beginning of Israel's physical calendar. This is Rosh Hashanah. They celebrate the New Year on the Feast of Trumpets. But tonight, two nights from now, this begins their spiritual, most holiest time of the year. From Passover all the way through to First Fruits and through Pentecost. Now, what does that mean for us as children of God? What you have right here is the plan of God for us all. We're justified by faith at the cross. We reckon ourselves dead. We go into that tomb. When Christ went into that tomb, we went in there with him, this burial. That is the process of where we die to self and the Holy Spirit makes us a new creature and when we come out of the tomb when he came out of the tomb it was a type of us being a new creature in Christ Jesus but the power that brought us out of that tomb is the Holy Spirit and that's the same power that is changing every one of us tonight that's why this feast is so important now move on are you with me so far I'm getting mostly head nods, yes, so we're good. All right. The second thing about this feast was a male lamb of the first year had to be slain. First of all, they had to take the lamb into the house. They did that on the 10th of Nisan. They held that lamb for four days. Really, you could say three days, but it was four days. It was three days inspection. And then on the fourth day... They sacrificed that lamb. <coughs> and if there was any blemish in that lamb, they were to get rid of that lamb. They could, not, they could not use that lamb for their sacrifice. They just couldn't do it. When Christ was brought in to the Sanhedrin, 
and he was brought in to Pilate. He was brought into Annas, the uh, high priest. He was brought into Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, and all the high priests of Israel. They inspected him probably two nights or more before they crucified him, and every single one of them found no fault in him. Remember that? He was a type of that lamb that Israel would take into their house and inspect. And they would have to make sure that that lamb was faultless. That that was faultless. Let me tell you this tonight, folks. Let me tell you this. That lamb became part of that family. Can you imagine, because, I mean, we all got pets. I, I don't mean to lessen the, the importance of the lamb, but the family bringing that lamb in, it was more than an inspection. They were to identify with that lamb. And when we come to Christ and he sacrificed his blood for us, guess what? He identified with us. And we identify with him. And when he was crucified, you see, there are many people that know about the crucifixion. They can tell you historical facts about the crucifixion. They can, they can tell you things about Jesus' death. They can give you all sorts of historical things. <clears throat> but until you embrace the Lamb, you follow where I'm going with this? Until you embrace the Lamb, and you hold the Lamb, and you keep the Lamb, the Lamb means nothing to you, does it? And Christ wants us to take him in the house. Many people want salvation outside the house. You've got to bring the lamb into the house. Amen? That's good, isn't it? They had to bring the lamb in the house and inspect it and then sacrifice it. <clears throat> the next thing is the whole community was required to participate in the sacrifice with no exception. I mentioned the verse here in Exodus 12 that you can read this in 12 and 6. And I'll go back and read that. And it says this, it says, And you shall keep it until the 14th day, and the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it. And if you go back to verse 3 or 4, it says, And the household be too little for the lamb. Let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make you count for the lamb. Let me tell you this about Christ tonight, folks. You cannot be saved on anybody else's salvation. Every single Israelite that night in Egypt had to participate in this or they were doomed to die. I'm going to get to the part of the rapture tribulation here in a minute, but I want to just say this. There was a death angel that God had told Moses that was coming. And if they didn't follow these instructions for the Passover, that soul was going to be cut off from Israel and cut off from God, probably executed, and they would have probably died that night when that death angel came through. Listen to me. This was given to Moses in the Torah. This was the instructions for all this was laid out in what God had given him to the detail. If Israel disobeyed that word, Israel would have perished. If Moses disobeyed and didn't tell Israel's right, Moses would have perished. The bottom line is he wanted to make it clear, God wanted to make it clear to Israel, everybody had to sacrifice and participate and partake of the Lamb. Let me say it clearly tonight, folks. We all got to partake of the same Jesus. Can I tell you, there ain't one Lamb for the Jews and one Lamb for the Gentiles. There ain't one Lamb for us Americans and one Lamb for the Europeans. There ain't one Lamb for the people in India tonight and one Lamb for the people in Africa tonight. There ain't one lamb for any group. There ain't one lamb for us white folks and one lamb for them black folks. Amen? Amen. I might as well medal for the first time tonight. I medal three times this afternoon. I'll medal for the first time tonight. There ain't one lamb for the Democrats and one lamb for the Republicans and one lamb for the mega folks. Amen? Amen? We all have to participate in one lamb. And every soul, every soul 
every soul was accountable to make sure that they partook of that Passover lamb. It's a type of Christ. The whole world. He came to die, folks, for the entire world. He came to Israel. Yes, he came to his own. His own received him not. But when John saw him that day at the River Jordan, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Let me give you a quick revelation of something. The Lamb has been a theme in the Bible going back to Genesis. In Genesis, he was a lamb. He, he was a lamb for a man in Abel's case. In Abraham's case, he was a provisionary promise. He became the lamb for a house in Egypt. He became a lamb for a nation at the Day of Atonement. And when Jesus died on the cross, he became a lamb for the entire world. In Revelation, he's called the glorified lamb. In Revelation, he's seen as a slain lamb. Glory to God tonight. He's been the Lamb of God from the dawn of eternity. Even before the worlds were created, God had ordained this Lamb to be slain. Before even He thought about creating this sinful, wicked world, He didn't create the world that way. Sin entered into the world through Adam. But before God even thought about the world, He had already thought about man's redemption. Isn't that good to think about that tonight? That God had our redemption in mind even before He had our creation in mind. That He wanted to redeem man from His fallen nature. He knew man would fall. He knew man would sin. He knew man would need a go-between. He knew man would need a redeemer. There will be millions of Jews that will sit down at a Passover table Monday night and they're blinded to this lamb. They're blinded to the fact that this lamb of God that I speak of tonight is their lamb. It's just their, It's the same lamb for them as it is for me tonight. There's no exception to this rule. All are alike in the sight of God tonight. There are some that think they can be saved because they're good. And they think that they bring, it's just like Cain when he brought his works. They think, well, I can be saved. I don't need a lamb because my works are good enough. Let me tell you something, mister. Your works are not good enough. Your works are not good enough, ma'am. There's no good works that can take the place of this lamb. Every single soul had to partake of that lamb in Israel. And every single soul tonight that makes heaven and eternal life their destination for God has got to partake of that lamb as well, with no exception to that rule. This is where the church has failed the most in its messaging. Because we have tried to convince people that there are other ways to deliverance and there's other ways to God and there's other ways of salvation. And I want to make a strange statement to you tonight, and I want you to hear me very carefully tonight, folks. There is no salvation in the church. There is no salvation in the church. The church makes you believe that the church has the solution for you. The church has you believe that their programs and their schemes and their formulas and their prayers and their prophetic utterances and their cleaning your DNA out and then getting your generational tree corrected and your psychology. The church has become nothing but a one big counseling sofa. That's what it's become. You go to a church, they don't take you to the altar like they used to. I tell you what, when I was growing up, and you come into church, you feel something called Holy Ghost conviction, and I tell you what you do. You'd either run to that altar or you'd run out in about five minutes. Y'all remember those days? I enjoyed those days. I enjoyed those days quite well. And I tell you what, if you did have sin in your life, or if there was something going on in you that wasn't right, or you was lost, let's say you didn't even know the Lord, you either left mad or glad, amen? Y'all can do better than that on a Saturday night. You either left mad or glad. Amen. We don't tell the world that anymore. That's not what the church preaches. This, this bloody religion, the world, the church wants nothing of it. The world, the world dies tonight in sin. The world's dying in its iniquity. The world is dying in darkness. The world is blinded. The world doesn't know Christ, and the church is offering it psychology. The church is offering it some scheme that, well, if you'll come to us and let us fix you, 
and they circumvent the lamb. Just like Cain circumvented the lamb in that garden, he brought the works of his hands to God, and God refused, refused to accept his sacrifice. And I can tell you tonight, God is refusing the sacrifices of man. He will never circumvent the cross. He will never circumvent this right here. This is the beginning of months, and every soul must partake of that sacrifice for our salvation and our deliverance. Can I just be blunt with you? If man could fix you, man has sure done a horrible job if we can fix each other as human beings. You look at this human race. This human race is in the worst shape it's been in the history of man, and we've got the church trying to tell us they can fix this sin-cursed earth by their programs and by their schemes. Folks, the church can't even fix its chandelier. Amen? We can't even get the church to love each other. We can't get the church to come together and come into a fellowship and be in one accord over the Word of God. you got churches that don't even want to preach the Bible. You've got people that don't even believe the Bible is a moral compass. They'll tell you that to your face. Well, the Bible is not our moral compass. we got to go with the Spirit. <laughs> Let me tell you something. The Spirit of God is never going to circumvent the cross of Christ because the Holy Spirit anoints the message of the cross He has from the beginning. The Spirit and the Word agree. Somebody's telling you to come out and do some kind of formula and some kind of scheme and let me come counsel you of your demons. Let me cast your demons out of you. Neighbor, the church couldn't cast a demon out of a flea right now with the power of God that it does not have an exhibit. <coughs> this nonsense that's going on in the name of God tonight, folks, I'm going to tell you something. We want to know why this world's in the sin state it's in. I'll tell you why it's in the sin state it's in. Because we have circumvented the cross and we have denigrated the cross. We have denigrated the Lamb. And we don't understand that every single soul must participate and partake in the Lamb of God. Can you say amen tonight? Amen. And the world perishes because of it. We used to send the sinner to the altar to have him pray through for repentance. Now we send him to the shrink. We used to tell the sinner, you need to get saved. You need to get born again. Jesus can save you from your sin. Now we tell the sinner, if you'll come in and join our little catch em all club and come to our yoga parties and come to our church functions, we'll get you right, baby. And there was one doctrine out there for a while uh, with one of the big-name mega pastors, and not the one you're thinking, but there's another one out there that was big in the early 2000s, and he was teaching this... Uh, identification salvation that means if you just hang around people that are saved that their salvation will rub off on you and, and you'll just get a whiff of that and that will rub off on you and that will be enough to get you in the gate. Let me tell you something, folks. There's a lot of people burning in hell that thought they could get in on mama's coattails and daddy's coattails and brother's coattails and their pastor's coattails. You can't get into the gate. You can't go to heaven on anybody else's lamb. you got to partake of that lamb yourself. Don't make me get to preaching. Are you with me tonight? Yes. Yes. Glory to God. Passover. The beginning of months. It's the beginning of months. The whole community had to participate in the sacrifice. The whole world has got to embrace Christ or it perishes. Regardless of its nationality. We were talking about this before the camera came on. And I'm going to mention it for a few minutes here. We have changed the plan of God for salvation down to a, I don't know how to put this, I don't know how to term it, I don't know if there's a term for it, this nationalistic salvation that we are saved because we're Americans, or we're saved because we're conservative, or we're saved because we're part of the mega party. Folks, listen to me. You're going to hear what I said to you earlier, but I'm going to say it for them. It's what happened in National Israel. National Israel thought wrongly that because they were God's chosen people, that God would never reject them as a nation. 
They believed that. They believed that they had a special place in God's plan, that there was nothing they could do that would cause God to uproot them from their land and to cause God to reject their country. They believed that they were the chosen frozen. And if you don't believe that that spirit operates in the church tonight, it does. I'll say this tonight to you here. You've heard me say it on the show, but I'll say it to you in person. Don't look at Christianity ever through the eyes of the American lens. Because our flavor of Christianity, our version of Christianity, is not even close to the true faith. Not. We see the American church and we say, well, the church is in a dire strait. Well, the American church is, but I want to tell you something. There's a true church out there that's not. Can I tell you something about the true church tonight? The true church embraces the cross. Can you say amen? The true church embraces the real Jesus. The true church ain't divided tonight, folks. Can I tell you tonight that the true church ain't chasing the poor doctrine around? I might as well just go ahead and let it all hang out. You ain't going to see me for a while. I've driven 16 and a half hours to this cold Sioux Falls, South Dakota <laughs> location. So I might as well get my money's worth on this Saturday night. The church ain't chasing abhorrent doctrine. The church ain't chasing boogeymen under Christian skirts. The church ain't believing Christians can be possessed by devils. The true church ain't believing that you've got to clean your generational tree out. The true church ain't believing this abhorrent mess of psychology that we can, we can counsel people out of their issues. Somebody needs to say amen tonight. The true church points the sinner to the cross. It points the sinner to Jesus. It points the drunk to the blood of Jesus. Points the drug addict to the blood of Jesus. Points the liar to the blood of Jesus. It points everybody to the love and the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. The true church. There's no division in the true church. Because the true church embraces the head of the church, which is Christ. And it has participated and it has partaken of the Lamb and taken the Lamb into the house. Let me tell you what God told Israel to do that night as well. He said, you eat all of it. You eat all of it. None of it is to be left at any time. When you kill this Lamb, and I'm going to get to the blood part in a minute, but they took the flesh, they roasted it with fire, and he said, you eat it all. Let me tell you something tonight, friend. You can't just have a little bit of Jesus. The little dab of you ain't going to get you through the duba. Amen? Can I say that again? A little dab of you ain't going to get you through the duba. We have got to partake of all of Him or we're partaking of none of Him tonight. We are either all in the faith we are either all on the cross. We are either embracing the cross and the message of the cross. We are either holding on to the cross or we're holding on to a false security, a false faith, an apostate faith, another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. We are either eating all of the true Christ or we're eating none of Him. what Passover means. It's more than just gathering together and eating a Passover Seder, neighbor. This is what it represents. It represents the true Christ and the true Lamb. Moses was told, you take that blood and you take the blood of the sacrifice lamb and you put it on the side post and you put it on the top and the house that had the blood on it. He said, Moses, there's a plague that's coming. There's a plague that's coming. There's a plague that's coming. God had dealt with Pharaoh. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. God had dealt with Pharaoh's heart, and his heart, it, Pharaoh's heart was so hardened, he would not let Israel go. God had sent Moses down there, and, 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 and he said, Tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And every time that 
Moses would do that. Moses <clears throat> would be met with this refusal and plagues would fall on Egypt. We're going to get to them in a minute because it's a type of what's coming on this earth. There's a plague coming, folks. But this plague that God was speaking of was something unique because this was after God had exhausted all of the efforts to get Pharaoh's attention. It hardened his heart. Can I tell you something tonight you may not want to hear? I know that we think that judgment would change this country. We, I think, I think we've all have thought that. Well, Lord, if maybe if you get us to our knees and you get our attention, and you bring judgment to America, maybe America will change. Can I tell you, it won't. It won't. It won't. One of the scariest verses of the Bible to me is found in Romans nine and eleven. During the great tribulation, this earth is going to experience God's wrath in a way that it's never experienced before. And judgments very similar to those that were in Egypt, we'll look at in just a second, very similar. And I'm going to go ahead and just show you that right now. Maybe I need to go ahead and do that right now. Um, let me show you these. There were ten of them. There were ten plagues in Egypt. Number one, he turned the water to blood. You can read this. We'll get this printed out and we'll put it on the website. Let me get out of the way so you can see this. You might want to write this down. There were ten plagues that led up to this one plague that God was going to do. In blood, he turned the Nile to blood. In Exodus 7 and 20, it was one of the first that Moses performed with that rod and that staff. Revelation 8, 8 and 9 speaks of one of the trumpet judgments where the water will be poisoned and turned to blood, literally, in the Antichrist kingdom. Men will die because of it. It was one of the very similar plagues of Exodus 7 and 20. Number two, there were frogs that came out of the Nile and punished Egypt. Exodus 8 and 6. Exodus 8 and 6. In Revelation 16, 13 through 14 and 15, it sees that John saw a vision of three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the false prophet. Those frogs, John saw this in the spirit realm. The frogs in Egypt were literal. The frogs that John saw were spiritual. Exodus 8.17 speaks of lice that hit Egypt. It killed the cattle. Didn't face Pharaoh a bit. Didn't even move the barometer one bit in his heart. When that didn't work, God sent swarms of flies on wild beasts. And <clears throat> let me change this right there. He sent swarms of locusts and swarms of things that hit the cattle in Egypt. You can read that in Exodus 8 and 21. Let me read that. Let me read some of these to you. Swarms of flies, lice in Exodus 8 and 6, 8 and 17 I should say, and in 8 20, and the Lord said, rise up early and say unto him that if I will send swarms of flies upon you and upon your servants and the houses of the Egyptians shall be swarms of flies and also the ground where all their own. Pestilence in Exodus 9 1 through 5. Exodus 9, 1 through 5. The cattle, the cattle will, were stricken by a grievous plague. And he severed the difference between the cattle of Egypt and the cattle of Israel. 
Exodus 9 and 10, boils, boils came upon the Egyptians. If you read Revelation 16, 1 through 2, during the great tribulation period, one of the vile judgments, and let me just say this, we don't have time to get into it all tonight, seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials are going to be judgments that are going to be poured out on the earth during the great tribulation period that strike the nature, it strikes men, and it strikes the earth. Nature, the heavens, men are going to be directly affected by it, and then there are going to be judgments that affect the earth, darkness. Boils are personal. Just as the boils broke out over the Egyptians in Exodus 9 and 10, there will be boils and malignant sores that will hit people in the Great Tribulation period. Hail, hail fell upon Egypt and it was mingled with fire. In Exodus 8, 29, 22 through 24, and then in Revelation 8 and 7, in the trumpet judgments, hail will be one of the judgments of Revelation. Locusts, direct locusts, Exodus 10, 1 through 6, God sent locusts, sent locusts upon the face of Pharaoh's kingdom. And in Revelation 9, 3 and 4, locusts will be part of the judgment upon the earth. There will be demon locusts that come from the faith. I want you to notice something about these judgments. The ones in Egypt were physical. They could see with their natural eye. Some of these judgments in Revelation are going to be spiritual. You won't see them with the natural eye, but they'll be spirit beings that will be on this earth. This locust, army of locusts, demon locusts, you can read about in Revelation 9, it will torment men for nine months. They will have the sting of a scorpion. In fact, I'll read that to you if you want me to. Revelation 9, 3, and 4. I want you to listen to this. Revelation 9, 3, and 4. Revelation 9, 3, and 4. It says this. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and upon them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And it was given to them that they should not kill them, but they should torment, be tormented for five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, which he strikes the man. And I want you to look at verse 6. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die. And death shall flee from them. The torment of Revelation 9 will be so bad that men will literally want to die on this earth. That is a spiritual army. That man will probably, men will not even see these locusts, I don't think. I think this, John saw this in the spirit realm. Whatever this will be, now whether it's physical or spiritual matters not, the, the result of it is going to be real. And men are going to be so tormented they're going to want to die. The plague number nine before the plague that Moses was talking, to God was talking to him about the firstborn was darkness. In two separate occasions in Revelation 8 and 12 and Revelation 16 and 10, both in the trumpet judgments and both in the ball judgments, great darkness is going to hit the kingdom of the beast. It says in one of the passages in Revelation that the darkness will be so great that they will gnaw at their teeth. Egypt gnawed at their teeth. By the way, Israel was in light when Egypt was in darkness. In the Great Tribulation, folks, there ain't going to be no, it's going to be worldwide. So Moses tells, or God tells Moses, Moses, there's a, there's a uh, play coming. There's a play coming. Hang on just a second.
And he said, I want you to put the blood. We're almost done. I want you to put the blood on the doorpost. I want you to put the blood on the doorpost. This death angel is coming. Folks, let me tell you something about the Great Tribulation period tonight. When I get back to Sioux Falls, and I'm coming back, we're willing. Don't know when it'll be, but I hope we can do this again. It's been a blessed weekend. Let me tell you something. Jesus said this statement in Matthew 24 about the tribulation period. He said, if it was not for the elect's sake, in Matthew 24, no flesh should be saved. Jesus said that this time of tribulation will be such a time on this earth, it will be no time like it in the past. There's never been a time like it in the past. There'll never be a time like it in the future. You do not want to be here for this time. This is not, this is not some... Um, blip on a radar this is not some uh hyperbole this is not some melodramatic push for people to get saved folks i don't have to tell you that jesus is coming for the rapture of the church to get you to get saved you could walk out of this hotel tonight and drop dead of a heart attack today is the day of salvation whether jesus is coming next week next month next year if he's coming tonight or 10 years from now 50 years from tonight you need to be ready to meet him amen you don't need a great escape hatch. You don't need a trumpet to warn you that Jesus is coming and be ready to meet him because our life is but a vapor. <coughs> Here one minute and gone the next. And folks, if you think about it, even if we live to 100 years old in light of 6 million years or 6,000 years of eternity, in light of eternity, which is billions and billions of years, and you're just starting, that's a blip on the radar. That ain't even a blip. It's like a little speck, about that big. That's what we are in light of eternity. But death is going to rule the tribulation like it's never ruled the earth before. There's a death angel coming. There's a death angel coming. And Moses was told by God, he said, put blood, put blood on the doorpost. And many Bible scholars believe that that blood was in the form of a cross on that door. If you looked at it. Listen to me, friend. Judgment is coming. All will be there. Who hath rejected? Who hath refused? O sinner, hasten. Haste to his voice. For I will pass. I will pass over you when I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Christ our Redeemer died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. Those who believe are saved from the storm. For he will pass. He'll pass over you. When I see the blood. When I see the blood. When I see the blood. I will pass. I will pass over you. When I see the blood when i see the blood when i see the blood i will pass i will pass over you it's what god told israel some four thousand years ago that promise tonight remains the same do you realize that tonight to our families to our lost children, to our lost loved ones, to our lost friends, to our lost spouses, to our lost church buddies, to the world tonight. The same God of Egypt is the same God in heaven tonight that is pleading with this world through the cross, pleading through this world, pleading to the world tonight to get in the house and get under the blood because the death angel is coming. 
five-sixths of the world's population, including two-thirds of the Jewish race, are going to perish in the Great Tribulation period, folks. You know what makes me stick to my stomach? What the church gets its feathers in a wad about matters absolutely little in eternity. And what the church spends its time ranting and raving about and accusing and basically acting like the fool over and screaming and screaming and acting like a bunch of spiritual apes about matters nothing in light of eternity. Folks, Jesus is coming. 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 All will be there. Those who've rejected, those who've refused. Listen to me. Death is coming upon this earth. The only way we escape that is to be ready for the rapture of the church. And when He comes in those clouds, He's going to look for one thing and one thing alone, neighbor. He's looking for the blood on the doorpost. Can you say amen? I want to say it again tonight. I want to say it again tonight. When He comes in the clouds, He's looking for those with the blood on the doorpost of their heart. Now, let me wrap this up. It's 830, and I don't want to keep you late tonight. Y'all been a beautiful audience, and I don't want to keep you long. I want you to listen to me as I close. The Lord told Moses. He said, Moses, I'm coming through Egypt tonight. I'm coming through Egypt tonight. Now, we're going to look tomorrow. I want you to be with me because we're going to look at the Passover table. And probably the Passover table is very likely, and very similar to how the Israelites laid it out. But it's how a modern Passover Seder table typifies all of these elements that I'm sharing with you tonight. But there's something that he told Moses, and I want you to look at this with me. And it's ver in verse... Um, It's in verse um, 11. Verse 11. He says, And thus you shall eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and the staff in your hands. You know what that was? God was telling Egypt that night? You realize, folks... Think about this. Think about this. Israel had been in Egyptian bondage for 436 years. Can you imagine that? 436 years. And on this night, and on this night, and on this night, they were getting ready to leave Egypt for the final time. Think about that. God had heard their cry for 436 years, but this was the moment they were getting ready to go. Can I tell you something tonight? We're getting ready to leave Egypt. Can you say amen, somebody? I don't know about you. I don't want to stay in Egypt. I don't know what it is about this bunch that wants to stay down here and go through the tribulation and fight the Antichrist and dig holes and go out and get canned goods. I don't know what they're thinking. I'm not looking for some hole in the ground, neighbor. I'm looking for a hole in the sky. I'm not listening and not worried about who the Antichrist is and who he is, and I could give two bit pins less. I know what the Bible says about him. I'm looking for the Christ. 
I'm not listening to the sound of this world. I don't care what this world's got going on with it. I don't care who wins the Oscars, who wins the Emmys. I don't care who's on TV tonight and who's not on TV tonight and who what actor died and what this actor died and this actress died. I could care less of what the world has to say. I could care less what the world does. I don't care. Look, I love sports, but sports is not my God. I don't care ultimately who wins the World Series and who don't and who don't win this and who don't win that because this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I'm getting ready to leave Egypt. Can you say amen somebody? Can you say amen somebody? Go ahead and give my hand tonight. Glory to God. If you want to stick around and fight the Antichrist, have at it. Make yourself at home. Make yourself feel good. Half the church tonight don't even believe a rapture exists. Another three-fourths of the other remaining half will argue with you till they're blue in the face about the timing of it and convince you that the world's going to, we're going to go through the tribulation with the world. The church has not been appointed to wrath tonight, folks. The church has been appointed to escape Egypt. God told Moses, he said, put that blood on the house. And guess what? When you get ready to go, you're going to get ready to go at any second. Have your loins girded. That's awareness. That's being vigilant. That's being sober. Let us be sober. First Thessalonians 5 talks about let us be vigilant. Let us be sober. Let us be of a sound mind. If we've ever needed some Christians to get their head out of the Q gospel and get their head out of this political mess and get their head off this abhorrent New Age humanism and get their head out of psychology and get their head out of all this false doctrine and be sober and be sober and be sober and be sober and be vigilant and looking for the coming King tonight. It is tonight on this April night of 2024 on the eve of Passover tonight. Can you say amen? We're called to be sober. Sober people are people that are looking to leave Egypt at any minute. Can you say amen? Moses wasn't being told. Moses, hang on. After the death angel passes, you guys got to stay in Egypt for another 400 years. No, God told Moses, get your shoes on, boy. Y'all getting ready to leave. <laughs> ho, ho! Glory to God. And that night, that night, that night, when that death angel came through, everyone that was in that house behind the blood was spared, and everyone that wasn't the firstborn of Egypt, from Pharaoh's firstborn all the way down to the lowest of cattle, perished. Neighbor, we're getting ready to get out of here. We're getting ready to get out of here. Listen carefully to me. I'm going to do some Methodist teaching, as my dad used to call it, for about five minutes. I don't need 15 tonight. I need five. Listen to me. There are two comings. There are two comings of Jesus Christ, one for the church and one with the church. The coming for the church could happen at any minute right now. There's nothing that will take place, can, has to take place right now prophetically that is hindering him from coming for the church. There is nothing. There is a ton of things that has to take place for him coming with the church. The Bible is replete with warning after warning after warning with warning telling us to watch and to pray and be alert for his second coming tonight. Amen? There is nothing in this Word of God that tells the church to put your stakes up in Egypt, to build your kingdoms here on this earth, to basically look around and don't look for His coming. If anything, it warns the individual that is not watching for His coming. He is going to be left behind in Egypt. If you want to get left behind in Egypt, then don't look for His coming. You don't believe He's coming, then don't believe He's coming. You're going to be left behind. I know people say, well, the rapture, you don't have to believe in the rapture to be saved. I tend to disagree, neighbor. You can't believe. Let me tell you something. Do you realize the rapture completes your salvation tonight? You were justified at the cross. 
You're being sanctified by the Holy Spirit every day. And Paul says one day we're going to be glorified. When do you think that's going to take place? It ain't going to be taking place at the great Easter bunny hop in the sky. It's going to be taking place at the rapture of the church of Almighty God. Can somebody say amen tonight? This Christian bunch, and excuse me for my emotion, I'm just, I'm angry tonight, folks. I feel the grieving of the Holy Spirit on the garbage, the spiritual garbage that people believe about the second coming tonight because they don't read this book and they're listening to false teachers that mock the rapture and mock the second coming of Jesus and deny His coming. Listen to me. Peter said in the last days they will deny His coming. They will deny His coming, bringing in damnable heresies, doing it. In Sioux Falls, I'm going out of here tonight with some passion and begging you tonight. I love you all. I have bonded with you this weekend. I beg you tonight. I'm going to these cities to do exactly what I'm doing tonight everywhere to plead with you to get ready for the rapture and to watch for His coming. Because it's getting ready to whack this thing up in the church age neighbor. We're getting ready to get out of Egypt. We're getting ready to leave. We're getting ready to leave. We're getting ready to leave. Can you say amen tonight? There is no greater doctrine in the Bible than this rapture of the church. My dear friend in the back, he was right. You ain't going to find the word. But I tell you what. Let me just finish my statement about the salvation thing. If you don't believe in the rapture, you don't believe in the resurrection. You know why? Because the resurrection and the rapture are the same. And the Bible pretty much says to be saved, you got to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And if you believe God raised Jesus from the dead, you pretty much got to believe that he's going to raise you and I from the dead and he's going to carry us to heaven when the trump sounds. Amen? Yeah. Sort of an oxymoron to these rapture deniers. I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. But I don't believe Jesus is coming. Well, let me explain to you, friend. You're going to be resurrected from the dead. When do you think that takes place? No, the rapture and the resurrection is the same. You can't say you don't believe in the rapture and then claim you're saved tonight because you've got to believe in the resurrection to be saved. Amen. I know this is tough talk, and I know there's some people spewing their little venom and their little teeth and biting their, gritting their little teeth and all what's left of them, and they're just biting their tongue and, and just, oh, I wish I was up there to fight with McDonald. I wish I was up there. Just see the grinding of the spiritual ignorant. Let me tell you something. When that trump sounds and the church of the living God leaves this earth, there ain't going to be none of this joking about it. And these plagues that are following are going to follow after this trumpet. I'm going to tell you something. When the, when the world is plunged into darkness and the world is plunged into judgment like it's never been plunged in, I want to see these so-called Christians out there trying to explain to the world that the rapture ain't real then. Can somebody say amen tonight? You know what's so sick to me is the fact that you're going to have half the preachers of America on CNN trying to explain the rapture away as some phenomenon that don't even mean anything in the Bible. I'll amen myself on that one tonight. Man, I'm a little wired up. I, this, this cold air seemed, seemed to got to me up here this weekend. Good grief. But I'm going out with a bang. Here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota tonight, folks, I'm trying to get something across to you. Jesus is coming. 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 Can you say amen? amen. I was sharing with the lunch crowd this afternoon, and Charles and Amy. Did I get your name right that time? <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> That's my buddy. <laughs> How many of you remember Paul Revere? I'm going I'm to go home on this. Y'all remember Paul Revere? Paul Revere was famous for the colonies. He had a unique <laughs> mission. The British were coming. British were coming. Paul Revere got on a horse one night, <clears throat> rode through the streets of Lexington, Massachusetts, holds up that lantern, 
just riding, 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 riding all over. The British are coming. 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 Let me tell you something about that little incident in American history tonight, folks. If Paul Revere would have been alive today, you know what the modern church would have done? They would have got on social media. They would have started researching his past, trying to figure out if he was Illuminati or not, <laughs> trying to figure if he was part of the cabal or not. Correct? They would have argued and argued and argued if he was even worthy to get on that horse to ride through Lexington. Well, he's not an ordained minister. He can't go through there. He's not been ordained to do that. I'll amen myself. And then, I tell you what else the church would have done. That lantern he was holding. They would have argued what kind of lantern he was holding. You would have had half the church, well, it was blue. It needs to be blue. It needs to be red. It needs to be white. It needs to be this color. It needs to be that color. That's not the appropriate lantern he's holding. Am I right? And then the other part of the church would have been slandering him like night is day. They would have been slandering him. They would have been found anything that they could find with his character. You would have seen X go crazy. Paul Revere is a rapist. Don't think, it's, it's, folks, I'm telling you, this is the modern church of America. This is the modern situation of America. And I'm making a point in this. They would have never heard a word he said. What was he warning them of? He was warning them that the British were coming to kill them. Right? They didn't hear that. They wouldn't have heard that today. Because that's exactly what the church is doing right now. They're ignoring the warnings that Jesus is coming. They don't live like it. If we lived in light of that, if we truly believed Jesus was coming, we wouldn't be doing the crazy, stupid, moronic stuff that we're doing. We would not do it. But let me warn you tonight, whether people feel I'm worthy enough to say it or not, whether people care about the lantern I'm doing it in and what jacket I've got on and what vest I got on and what color my hair is or whatever else color they want to argue about let me tell you something I am just as much able to tell you tonight that Jesus is coming as anybody I'm an ordained man of God with the Bible in hand and the Holy Spirit in my heart and Jesus in my soul and I'm telling you tonight Jesus is coming Jesus is coming Jesus is coming Jesus is coming Stand to your feet. <clears throat> you get something out of this tonight? Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. <laughs> this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up. Somewhere beyond the blue, all oh, those angels beckon me to heaven's open shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I can almost hear the Israelites singing that as they got close to leaving Egypt. This world is not my home. We're just a passing through. Moses, our treasures are laid up. Somewhere beyond the blue, those angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Neighbor, I pray that everyone in this house is saved tonight. I'm assuming everybody is. <coughs> but I know that there are some that are watching me tonight that are not. Neighbor, it's getting late. It's getting late. It's getting late. It's getting late. I don't know totally why the Lord has had me do these conferences this year like this. This is the fourth one we've done, and we've got more to come. And I pray, I do, that the Lord brings me back here in His timing. 
You all have touched my heart being out here like you have this weekend in this cold weather. Look, y'all have went beyond the call of duty. This has been a brutal weekend weather-wise in Sioux Falls. It really has. It's been cold, but y'all have come out today faithfully. You've been here last night. You're going to be with me tomorrow. I don't know if I'll ever see you again personally. But if I don't see you on this side of this trump, I can guarantee you with the help and the grace of God, I'm going to see you in the sky. Amen. I'll see you on the other side. And I'll meet you in the heavens. And if I've gone and gone on, and you are still here, and I've gone on before you in death, please keep this fire burning in the true church here in South Dakota that Jesus is coming. That Jesus is coming. Young lady that's going to Brazil, you may outlive all of us. Keep the fire burning that Jesus is coming. Keep the fire burning that Jesus is coming. Keep the fire burning that Jesus is coming. Because He's coming soon, neighbor. And we better stop living like we care about staying in Egypt. We better be getting ready to go. Amen. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank You tonight for this Saturday night session. I pray that something that's been said has encouraged the hearts of the people and fired up the troops. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that if there be one listening to me tonight that's not sure they're ready to go in the rapture, if the trump of God sounded tonight, they wouldn't be sure. They're not sure if they're ready to go. They're not sure they're behind that door with the blood on it. That door represented Christ. That house represented Christ. It was the lamb for the house. Lord, I pray that they make things right with you before this night is out. Father, if there be some in here tonight that are not sure that if the trump of God sounded, that they would go. That before this night is out, they make things right with you. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name for this beautiful city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I pray you pour your spirit out here with a final move of God, Lord, before this trump sounds. That people will be saved, people will be healed, people will be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. People will be delivered from sin, people will be delivered from bondage, people will be delivered from things that they need to be delivered from. That people will get a new awareness of Jesus and His soon coming. That the fires will burn in their heart and soul and burn with a passion to live in light that Jesus could come at any minute. And Lord, I thank You again for bringing us to this city. And I pray, Lord, that Your Spirit, Your Spirit will undergird those here tonight and bless those here with a special presence this weekend and the coming days and weeks ahead. Father, protect those that are yours with the blood of Jesus tonight. We plead the blood of Jesus over this audience. We plead the blood of Jesus over those listening tonight. And we pray you get our hearts and souls ready. We pray you get our hearts and souls ready for your coming. In the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's people said amen. Sing this with me. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Those angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. You know it and sing it with me. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Those angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Are you ready to meet him tonight? Are you ready to meet him tonight? Are you ready to meet him tonight? May the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you. We'll be back here tomorrow. We're going to celebrate the Passover tomorrow afternoon through the Lord's Supper. Did you get something out of this? Say amen tonight. You can fellowship as we go out. May the Lord bless you tonight. In Jesus' name. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Be blessed. We'll see you tomorrow here too.